Today we are at the home of Hopkinton resident Kathy McDonald. You may see her on occasion over at Waterfresh Farm stocking the shelves uh, for Alima's purse over there. You may see her uh, in her own yard or home uh, with uh, her five children perhaps stopping by who are now grown and on their own way in life. You may see her on the streets of Boston giving sandwiches and warm clothing to the homeless. And if you don't see her around town or in Boston, it's likely she might be somewhere across the world, as far as way as Africa, where she's committed to her work building an orphanage, uh, helping people there live in remote villages. I'm curious to learn more about Kathy and her work and life and invite you to join me as we go and sit down and talk and have a conversation about all going on with her at this time. Please come and join me. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Thank you for having us in your home this afternoon. Uh, it's lovely here, even in the cold middle of January. <laughs> And in thinking about this interview with you, I was thinking that you do a lot of things in the world, and I mean that literally. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just wondering, for starters, if you had a day left, one day left, to be here on the Earth, uh, where would you go and how would you spend it? I know that's not an easy thing to ask, but I'm just curious, given yeah. all you do. Um, by the way, nice to have you here. It's lovely having you in our home. Um, if I had one day, I, I think I would do what I do every day. Mm -hmm. I would be here. Mm -hmm. I would want to be surrounded by my children mm -hmm. and my husband, but um, I love what I do. I, and, and I have been able to see so much of the world mm -hmm. that I realize what a blessing it is to live in this country, mm -hmm. what a blessing it is to live in this town, in this in this place so for me being here with my children and my friends would be a wonderful mm -hmm. a wonderful way a wonderful to spend day. my last day yeah right. yeah wow. well, that is it that's a good answer thank you and I know you weren't all really all that much prepared for it, so um, I know here in Hopkinton um, we can see you often over down the street at Waterfresh Farm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, you do a lot of work over there. I was wondering if you could start off and tell a little bit about what you do there and how you got started. Sure. Um, Alima's Purse is a gift shop located inside Waterfresh Farms Marketplace, mm -hmm. uh, and it started from part of our mission's work over in Africa, um, asking God, what, what is there that I can do to help these people more because the pover poverty was just unlike anything I'd ever seen here in the United States. In that particular um, area of Africa? We were in Mozambique, Africa. Mm -hmm. So we were on the far east coast mm -hmm. of Africa. Um, and just prayed about that and prayed about that. We continued to go back and forth, sometimes bringing literally tons of supplies to people mm -hmm. there, to different villages, to orphanages. But it just felt like it wasn't enough, that mm -hmm. certainly there's more that we could do. Um, probably five years after that, Katie Olson from Hopkinton, her sister, worked at a shop in uh, Lake Forest, Illinois, mm -hmm. where they had fair trade products that were sold. Um, one thing led to another, and I was able to do that to um, start a store here in Hopkinton that sold goods from women and gentlemen around the world mm -hmm. um, at Waterfresh when Jeff and Phil opened the shop. Um, they invited us in to sell our things there, mm -hmm. um, which has been just a wonderful relationship with uh, Donna and Phil and Jeff has been great. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been very successful. The point of having the store was that we would use all the money that we made to make a difference to people in severe need. Mm -hmm. So that was always the, the reason for the store, the re reason for Alima's Purse. The reason we named the store Alima's Purse was because the first time I went to Africa, there was a young woman that was my daughter Anna's age named Alima. Mm -hmm. And she took me everywhere I needed to go because I was always getting lost and always ending up in the wrong place. How old was she? She's the same age as Anna. So she was at the time 13, 14. Mm -hmm. um, and my last day there, she, we were walking to church and she said, I have something for you. Mm. And she pulled out a Tootsie Roll 
And I said, where did you get a Tootsie Roll? Because they don't, they don't have that much candy unless a visitor perhaps brings them something and gives them something, which was the case with Alima. Um, they have the same meal 364 days a year. Mm -hmm. So they have breakfast, they have a piece of bread and some tea. Dinner and lunch is rice and beans. Wow. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And I said, Alima, I can't take a Tootsie Roll from you. <laughs> I don't know when you're going to get another one. And she said, no, I want to give it to you. I love you. Mm. And mm. so she turned wow. and faced me, and we broke it in half. And she put one piece in her mouth, and mm. I put the other piece in my mouth. And she had this huge smile on her face. Mm. But I was sobbing mm -hmm. because wow. no one had ever given to me out of their poverty before. Right. And so still deeply touches me. So we thought when we were starting the store, how wonderful. Let's name it after her because it's one of the greatest lessons of my life mm -hmm. to give when it costs. You know, and in scripture, I'm a pastor in scripture, the only time Jesus said that something was good that a person did was when they gave and it cost them. Mm -hmm. That was good in his eyes. Mm -hmm. So we thought, let's name it after Lima and we'll give all the money away to those people that are in severe need, both here in the United States and abroad. Mm -hmm. So that's the story of Waterfresh. So it's a gift shop. It's a gift shop with unique, different gifts from artisans in the United States as well as abroad because the store is so large to have excellent quality. We needed to integrate um, some other artisans from the United States because there weren't enough fair trade artisans to fill Waterfresh because it's such a large store. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to have people, artisans from the United States, showcase there as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been a beautiful mixing of, of artisans. Mm -hmm. Wow. And is Alima aware of her? Alima is not aware, yeah, is but I will be home. seeing her. I will probably be seeing her. Anna, our oldest daughter, is in Africa right now. And when I go see Anna, I will go to the village and see if I can find Alima. Oh. Yes, yeah, oh, which will be how wonderful. Yeah, that yeah. Would be for her to hear. Yes, uh, yes. She'll be very. She'll be very mm. happy. I think. And uh, ju just to uh, jump aside, I know uh, that. Well, I guess at first I'll ask uh, the question: uh, When you speak of we, uh, are you speaking from church or from family uh, in terms of the work that we do? The work that we do. Um, we because. It, our family has always done things together like that. Mm -hmm. um, probably the most important thing we ever did with our children was to bring them over to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we brought a young man with us that we've known for years. We usually brought um, high school and college age people with us, along mm -hmm. with adults, but I really felt it's important to help our children understand the blessing that they have mm -hmm. living here, um, that that was important to Im imprint on them as they matured and got older, that, that there are people that need them that need the gifts that they have been given mm -hmm. to, to help their lives. So uh, we brought um, people over. So we were pastoring, doing youth pastoring work. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy to make that transition and just take, take all the kids with us and, mm -hmm. and go that way. So um, now, it, now Waterfresh, it's Gary and I. And there are people that volunteer that will call and say, do you need help doing something? Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's volunteer. I mean, my children know if they sit still here for too long in this room, they'll be given something to tag or mark mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. But um, so right now, it's our family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, uh, I know you've used the word um, that you work as missionaries mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as a family. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how, uh, how did you get started with that? Is that part of your background and growing up? Uh, um, I think for me, seeing people in need has always touched me deeply. Mm -hmm. um, even working in Boston, when I would walk down the street and there are homeless people there. Mm -hmm. um, when you were younger? When I was younger and then even as I you know, did some professional work downtown, mm -hmm. I would go out during my lunch hour like in the winter and I would like to get them socks and mittens and things like that just because my heart broke for them. Mm -hmm. My heart broke for them and there was one man I remember my friend and I were giving lunches out one day and he was sitting there and I was always afraid of him growing up. He had been there for a very long period of time mm -hmm. and I'd always been afraid of him. And my friend went up and, and gave him a lunch, and I thought, I'm scared of him. And he couldn't eat. He was so intoxicated, he couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. And so she took the sandwich, and she pulled it apart, and she fed him. And he started sobbing. Mm -hmm. wow. And the reality of this person that I had been afraid of really changed. And I think from that point on, I never looked at people as I'm afraid of their condition anymore. Mm -hmm. I just need to understand what caused that condition. Mm -hmm. And it helps me love them. Mm 
um, despite what their outward appearance is or what might come out of their mouth, mm -hmm. um, to love them is the important thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is. So it changed, it changed me quite a bit going out that day with her. Mm -hmm. you know, she went to the one person that I would not have chosen mm -hmm. to go with, mm -hmm. go over mm -hmm. to, and, the, and there he was, you know, in all his brokenness, a beautiful person that needed help. Mm -hmm. so. And you continue to do the work this kind of work in Boston, as well as going over to Africa yeah. now, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Even um, in Atlanta, I was just down in Atlanta, yeah. and, and the greatest part of being in Atlanta was talking to the homeless people. Mm -hmm. You know, the joy of my heart is just engaging them and seeing different things and what, what they need help with and why they need help and why they are where they are. And mm -hmm. um, it's always the most meaningful part of any little journey I go on or the people that I meet that, that are in need. Mm -hmm. because it, it triggers things. You start thinking of ways you can help and things that can, can change their life. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that is uh, inspirational, and I know that uh, there are uh, many uh, of us who, when go to the city, aren't exposed to it as often and wonder what the best uh, thing to do and wanting to be helpful. Uh, perhaps and, and feeling some of maybe that uh, reservation or mm -hmm. fear as you spoke about earlier. What advice would you say for people? Um, I think I look at them now when I look at people, I look at them as my children. Mm -hmm. One of my children mm -hmm. that, and something has gone very wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And would I want someone to stop and help my child no. if he or she were in that situation? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes even in Harvard Square, there's a lot of runaways there, and there was a young woman, and she went over to the optical store to see if they could fix her glasses, and they wouldn't fix her glasses because she looked like a homeless person. Mm -hmm. And so I said, give me your glasses. And so I went over, and they fixed them instantly, mm -hmm. which made me sad, mm -hmm. but also made me happy that I could be there for her and get things done for her that she needed because she was choosing to be homeless. Some people choose to be homeless, mm -hmm. some people are there and they would like not to be homeless. But mm -hmm. there are many people that are out on the streets that choose to live their lives that way and that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. they, still, mm -hmm. they still need help from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, that is a very uh, enlightening way of looking at it mm -hmm. and helping others to look at the situation and dealing with homeless also. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. for that good work that you do in Boston. Um, and I, I know it's in many different places, and we'll try mm -hmm. to talk about that as well. Um, in jumping around a little bit, so you have done this work with your children, and mm -hmm. you have five children? Yeah. Five and a daughter-in-law. Five and a daughter-in-law. Yes. Oh, well, congratulations. Yes. And uh, I know you're a very close uh, family, a large yes, family and close. And, um, how was it uh, bringing up your children in Hopkinton and uh, in this kind of a, a life experience for them? Um, you said uh, that you wanted them to feel the blessing of uh, what it's like to uh, grow up in this environment and also to be aware of how to contribute uh, outward with mm -hmm. all the blessings that they do have in their life. Uh, can you say a few words about uh, your children and raising them in this kind of... Uh, experience. I think Gary and I have loved raising our children mm -hmm. in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. um, the people here are so wonderful and so giving. Um, it, it really feels like a community, a beautiful place where, you know, as a mom or a dad, you know that, you know, anywhere your child is, someone's watching them. Mm -hmm. Someone mm -hmm. knows. And if something happens, someone's there. But also that you can, that they, that they have a, a breadth of, of people to call on, to learn from. Mm -hmm. um, I love the fact that they, that they track in school with, with the same group of kids mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it really watches, helps them understand how people change and grow and, and as you watch them mature alongside of yourself. Mm -hmm. So we've, um, we've loved that. We've also been very thankful that we could couple this experience with Africa mm -hmm. so that they, they see the blessing of community, they see the blessing of growing up with people that you, that you know all your life. You know, your friends, mm -hmm. our children's friends, are their friends from preschool mm -hmm. um, who come and go, and some of them have come with us to Africa, and it's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, but to have also that, because I think if they didn't have Africa, they might think that this is normal, mm -hmm. that Hopkinton is normal. Mm -hmm. Hopkinton is not normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopkinton is one of the greatest blessings that our children 
have been able to receive because it's a community that gives. It's a community that you can call and say or send out an email and say, I need help, and you'll get 4,000 responses. The mm -hmm. heart of Hopkinton is so big and beautiful that they also need to know that that's not normal. Mm -hmm. That is a blessing. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we've been very fortunate to show our children and have our children be exposed to some very, very, very good things that they can use to change the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make the world a better place. Yeah, that is a really important teaching uh, yeah. that you have provided for them. And as a result, I understand they are now all on their own path. They, they are. No longer living at home. And uh, I wonder if you can tell uh, for a few minutes uh, what they're doing at this point, what you have inspired uh, them to move on to perhaps uh, with their early experiences? So they are. So our, our oldest, Noah, is married and um, he met his wife when he was in Brazil on a youth missions trip. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are here. He's working and, and Isabella is going to school. So they live in Watertown right now. Uh, Benjamin just graduated from college and he is working and living in Brighton, um, mm -hmm. working in Wellesley. Sam, our middle child, Sam is doing a gap year working at a homeless shelter in Arizona yeah. and uh, loving that. So he's doing that for a year where he works, just works at, a, at the Andre house mm -hmm. in Phoenix. And he also ended up working, he graduated with a degree from forensics from St. Anselm's. Yeah. So he also somehow was able to um, get a job working Wednesday nights, which is his only night off, mm -hmm. into Thursday day working with the Homicide Forensics Unit in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So he goes out with them um, on homicide calls um, and does forensics work, wow. which is wonderful for him. Mm -hmm. So he's able to help out at the Andre house, and then mm -hmm. he's also able, able to get some good experience with mm -hmm. um, the forensics part of mm -hmm. his life. Like Our daughter, lucky to have him. Yes, yes, <laughs> he's enjoying it very much. Um, our daughter Anna just left for Africa. She's at an orphanage right now. Uh, and uh -huh. uh, then she'll be going over to Cape Town Saturday to spend six months at the University of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And our youngest Nathan is a first year at Butler and is enjoying it very much. Mm, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Uh, it does sound like uh, good news and uh, good beginning journeys they're all yeah, making out in the yeah. world and I, I know you said you heard from Anna. I did hear today. from Anna. Um, yeah. She sent you a little bit of uh, footage. She sent me a little bit uh, of footage, and yes. And you were able to share that uh, on yes. this. And I was wondering if you could just tell in a couple sentences. Sure. What this so Anna is at an orphanage that um, friends of ours have in South Africa. So they worked, actually the woman and the man that um, run the orphanage are friends of ours from Mozambique. No. Um, where we met them when we were at the first orphanage we went to. They, that orphanage is now set and established, and so they went down to South Africa and started another one in mm -hmm. South Africa. Um, so Anna is there working okay. with them and, mm -hmm. and uh, spending time with the children there, and then she'll move on to Cape Town at the end wow. of the week. Wow. So an it's good for her to be back. She was very, very happy to be able to go back to Africa. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, I think that we're able to take a look at yes, a little bit yes. of that footage uh, right now and show okay. Anna and what's going on with her uh, at the orphanage. Okay. So Great. let's take a look at that. And All right. Get back to a few questions. Okay. Yeah. It's me and you. Say hi. Say hi. Say hi. It's a video. What do you want to say to the people in America? Ah, uh, I want to beat. What do you want? <laughs> what do you want to say? Uh, hello. Hello, and what else? How are you? Let me hold it. Yeah? That's going to stop it. Okay. You want it to be over? Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful to see Anna. It looks like she's really happy over there. 
Yes, she, and the first time that we took our children over to Africa when we were leaving, Anna was, I think she was 12 or 13 at the time, and we were getting, loading up into the truck and she was sobbing, and I said, Anna, what, what's the matter, you know, what's the matter? And she, she was just sobbing and she said, this is where I belong, I belong mm. here, mm. and I don't want to leave. And so to see, to see her back again as a young woman, a grown young woman, and her heart is still is still full of joy being in Africa just delights me mm. although she's so far away she it makes me sad uh -huh. but I'm very glad for technology that allows me to connect with her daily mm. yeah, so. that's a beautiful film of her with the children there and it yeah. does look like she loves her work yes there. yeah um, so what a great experience for her to have and um, the contribution she can already give Mm -hmm. there and then learn more and um, it sounds like she's speaking of some calling she feels within her I wonder uh, had you felt that kind of calling early in your life or at some point or at recurring times in terms of all of the work related to uh, missionary work you've been doing you know we we live such different for me anyway I live such a different life as a youngster than my children mm -hmm. do. I didn't, I never was on a plane till I was going to college. Mm -hmm. You know, my children have spun around the world and just mm -hmm. have such a different perspective. Their friends are global. You know, my friends were in my little community. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, for me, I knew people needed help and that, that always, that always impacted mm -hmm. me. How can I, how can I just help this one person? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, I can't help the world, but I can help this person in front of me that's hungry. I can help, I can help find them what they need or get their glasses fixed for them. Mm -hmm. I can do one thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in exposing our children, it kind of opened up their heart to that, that Anna can love a nation that's not hers. Anna mm -hmm. can go and, and say, oh, I feel like this is home, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, for me, it would be like, wow, going to Hopkinton is a far, a far distance, and Hopkinton feels like home, but for, for my children, like, Noah is bilingual, mm -hmm. and they go back and forth to Brazil, and so Brazil is home for Noah in some ways, and um, I think it's the same way with Anna. Africa is home to her in some mm -hmm. respect, that it carries a strong love in her heart. So, yeah, it makes me feel good when my children are doing what... what um, feel like what they were created for to mm -hmm. impact the people that, that God had them to, to impact mm -hmm. is really very fulfilling for me as a mom. Well, it sounds like they have had very inspirational teaching experiences to help them listen to mm -hmm. the calling that they have and what they want to do yeah. out in the world. Um, I was going to ask you a little bit more about your time in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, what would you like to tell people listening um, that you have learned most from the people you have worked with over in Africa, your time spent there, maybe of uh, the joys uh, and the challenges uh, in the work and time you've spent with them? I think, I think one of the most profound lessons I learned besides Alima and her giving was um, how beautiful and simple their lives are mm -hmm. with mm -hmm not all the frills that we have, mm -hmm. how people that have one little hut mm -hmm. and their clothes fit in, think of a teenage girl, all of her belongings fit in a suitcase. Mm -hmm. That's what she has. And yet she's full of joy, mm -hmm. full of peace, full of contentment. Mm -hmm. There's no, no cell phones, there's no, <laughs> there's no video games, there's no monopoly. Mm -hmm. um, so their ability to to converse and, and talk to people and learn from one another and value one another um, always just struck me. So I think that's what I know when we came back from Africa the first time, our children didn't want Christmas to ever be the way it had been before. Mm -hmm. We had, you know, a very American Christmas, you know, stockings, gifts, and ever since then we've just done a grab and mm -hmm. we do it Sunday morning, you know, mm -hmm. or, or Christmas morning, we have breakfast together and we have a grab and everybody gets a name and they mm -hmm. have the whole year to choose that gift for the person. Mm -hmm. and, and that's all. Mm -hmm. Because in mm -hmm. Africa they just got one gift. Mm -hmm. That's all the children got. They got one gift. And um, I remember one young man that came with us. He was, a, uh, he was an early college student. And we were walking down Christmas morning and he said, Kathy, I've never, I've never cared about anybody else more than myself until today. I care for them more than I care for wow. myself. And wow. I thought, 
you know, that's worth going around the world for, because mm -hmm. he'll never be the same. That young man will never be the same. But I think that understanding that all these things are a wonderful blessing, but if they're all removed, having people that love you and care about you really is all you need. Mm -hmm. You know, they uh -huh. don't, they didn't have silverware, they ate with their hands. So they taught us how to eat with our hands and then we went to a hotel on our way home and all the kids were eating with their hands and people <laughs> in the hotel were appalled. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> I was just laughing. <laughs> like, well, you learned it well, but um, yeah, even just things like that, you know, it's very mm -hmm. communal. So if you don't have a pot, you just go to your neighbor's mm -hmm. hut and you get the pot that you need because there's only three pots in the whole community. So. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> but just learning that it's okay, mm -hmm. not having all of this yeah. is okay. Yeah. You're able to be happy and flourish and, and be full of joy and full of peace mm -hmm. without a lot of stuff. So and I what think, helps them through the hard times? Well, for them, they have never known this. Yeah. So people have said, would you ever bring Alima over? I said, no, 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 she would be ruined here. She would be ruined here. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, um, her joy comes from her friends and from her, her relationships and from helping others and doing her chores. That, that, you know, she knows English. This will help her when she gets out of the orphanage. It will help her to get a job if she can find a job or she can work in the orphanage. But mm -hmm. um, their life over there is beautiful and simple. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it doesn't necessarily mean, because we have a lot of things, that our life here is better. Mm -hmm. So for, I think for us as a family, that was a very important lesson, mm -hmm. that having more doesn't necessarily mean you have more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that, that would be, that and Alima's giving, giving when it cost her, were probably the greatest lessons that I've learned, mm -hmm. probably in my whole life, you know? Wow. Outside of, you know, um, you know, learning who God was, those are probably the two greatest lessons I've learned in my life. Wow. Well, this has been quite an interview, uh, and we have to end already, okay. but I was wondering if I could ask you to share um, some words that uh, you have mentioned, a uh, little uh, end blessing. Oh, uh, that yes. So this um, came from a friend when my father died. Um, he sent this over to me from, from Africa. I had met him over there. So I read this at my dad's, at my dad's funeral. And it says, God is supreme in his care for us, his judgment, grace, and mercy, and his glory. He is our Alpha and Omega, our beginning and our end. He leads our going out and our coming in. He is the most holy, the most beautiful. God makes our lives worthwhile and turns our death into the sweetest of rewards. Wow, wow, that is beautiful, yes. beautiful words.